Welcome to this Silicon Web Customers Guild Presents webinar, Reenactress, Discovering the Women Warriors of the Civil War with Documentary Director J.R. Hardman. A few preliminary slides about the webinar series. The Silicon Web Customers Guild webinar series offers talks by speakers on a variety of topics about costumes and costuming. The webinars are free to Silicon Web members but they may also be available to the greater costuming community on a space available basis. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future speakers or topics, send them to board at siwcostumers.org with the subject line webinar series. The chapter would like to acknowledge the International Costumers Guild, Marty Gear Costuming Arts and Sciences Fund for a grant award in support of developing this webinar series and to the ICG for making its Zoom platform available to chapters and special interest groups. A few notes on Zoom. Please leave or set your audio and video controls to mute. Feel free to chat or react during the presentation in the chat window. There'll be a Q&A period after the presentation. To ask questions, type it in the chat window, and you may optionally label it Q&A. When the webinar is over, please complete a brief survey on your experience. We use these to help improve the webinar series over time. Over 250 Civil War soldiers were actually women disguised as men. The historical record is incomplete because these heroines' amazing ability to pull off the disguises. In Reenactress, her first full length documentary, Director and reenactor J.R. Hardman reveals the history of women warriors during the Civil War who fought bravely in the service of their countries and the experiences of female Civil War reenactors and living history who dress as soldiers to fight on battlefields today. In this webinar, J.R. will discuss how she was inspired to make the documentary and to talk about the process of bringing these historical figures to life through reenactment. A brief introduction to the speaker. Jer Hardman is a filmmaker and documentarian, an educator and a Civil War reenactress. She joined PBS Utah in 2001 as an associate producer for local shows, This is Utah and Utah Insights. She's produced several other short documentaries and fiction films, which have been featured at film festivals. Jer graduated from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles with a BA in cinema and television production in Spanish. She can be reached at reenactress at gmail.com. She also wrote an article for the most recent issue of Silicon Web Customers Guild's virtual customer magazine called The First Reenactress. And there's a URL. Uh, the issue is available to members right now. It'll be available in February for the general community. So with that, let me turn it over to J.R. Hardman, and please go ahead. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm J.R. Hardman. I'm a filmmaker, and um, I started uh, reenacting, actually, during the 150th anniversary cycle of the Civil War. Um, the first reenactment I ever attended as a participant was actually the uh, 149th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg um, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And um, I went as a spectator uh, when I was in Gettysburg um, watching the reenactment. I was totally captivated by everything that I was seeing. And uh, over the course of the last uh, a little bit over a decade, I've actually um, started taking on that persona of a reenactor myself. Um, so what I'm going to talk about mostly today is my research for our documentary, uh, which is called Reenactress. It's about uh, not only the history of women soldiers in the Civil War, but also about uh, the experience of female reenactors and how they 
um, have experienced the reenactment world a little bit differently in many cases than uh, their male counterparts. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have some uh, images. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll uh, give a link to our website where you can also watch our most recent trailer of our film. Um, so over the course of my about a decade long experience researching women soldiers, I have found that uh, women soldiers have actually always been kind of sensational. Uh, if you have read anything about Joan of Arc or uh, Mulan, uh, people have always been fascinated by this idea that women would be disguised as men in order to perform some form of military service. Um, in the history of the world, uh, women were not always permitted to serve in the military, and the same thing goes for the history of the United States. Although we know through research that there has been women in the U.S. military since the founding of the country with the Revolutionary War, um, and there have been women who have served in um, really all aspects of military service uh, throughout our nation's history. However, in the past, um, women were not allowed to serve legally. Um, and so because there were certain roles for women uh, in, our, in our history, um, and at the time of the Civil War, there were several reasons why women might have wanted to join the military, even though it was not legally permitted for them to serve in uh, combat roles. So women earned less than men. Of course, we know that they still do in many cases. Uh, women did not have equal rights. They were not permitted to have their own bank accounts. They didn't have rights to their children. They didn't have rights to uh, participate or not uh, choose to participate in marriages. Um, they, during the war, um, many of the men went off to war and would leave the women at home, either on a farm or um, in another, you know, in a city. And so they would be separated from their loved ones by those other um, members going off to war. Um, women also were patriotic and have always been patriotic. Um, we know from uh, some of the founding documents and when they were being drafted that um, Abigail Adams had a lot to say about women not being allowed to vote when the Constitution was being written. Um, also, women through posing as men and serving in the military could access spaces that they'd never been able to access otherwise. And um, some women before the war and several of the women I'm going to talk about today were actually already living disguised as men before the war began. And so joining the military was actually just an extension of their existing uh, lifestyle. So in order for women to serve in the military, like I mentioned, it was illegal uh, for them to serve openly as women. I, ha I do have some exceptions though. Um, but we know that during the time of the Civil War in the 1850s and 60s, um, women always were seen with long hair. Most of the time it was pulled up in um, in a style like you can see here on the right. Um, you'll see that there's uh, several women here on the right um, that show you what the style of dress and the hairstyle was like. Um, and then you see our young men uh, here on the left. Um, you can see that many of the young men actually had hair about the length of mine. And um, they, in many ways, could look similar to what a girl would look like if she cut her hair. Um, what we know from most of the research is that the women who were posing as men in the military, they were not in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, they were similar age to a lot of the young men privates in the war. And so when people think, oh, you're trying to pass as a man, you won't be able to pull this off. 
what they don't realize is that the women weren't actually trying to pass as full-grown adult men with beards and low voices and um, the muscle mass of a full-grown adult man. They were trying to pass for boys. And so if they were able to cut their hair and if they weren't extremely developed or if they wore um, their disguise in a way that didn't make them look curvy, um, a lot of times they were not distinguishable for um, as women. Uh, people just assumed that they were, you know, 16, 17 years old and that their voice hadn't dropped yet and that they hadn't started growing facial hair because as we know uh, today even, uh, men tend to go through puberty a little bit later in their life cycle than women do. So who were these soldiers? Um, I'm gonna go through and show you some examples of people that either are documented to have served or are documented to have claimed to have served during that time period. Um, the first person that I think we have some of the absolute best documentation of is Sarah Rosetta Wakeman. She enlisted um, in a New York regiment, the 153rd New York Infantry, um, and she, um, you can see this is actually a photograph that was taken of her in her uniform. Um, when she joined the military, she was the oldest child in a very large family, and all of the other family members that were similar in age to her, she was a, um, a teenager when she joined the military, um, all of her other family members that were similar age were also girls. And so before the war, uh, she was actually serving as a boatman, uh, driving barges up and down the Erie Canal. And you can see here on the left side, that is a photo of uh, her younger sister. Um, the only boys in their family were um, little tiny children at the time that the war started. And so uh, Sarah Rosetta Wakeman was serving as a boatman, uh, driving barges up and down the Erie Canal so that she could uh, make money her, for her family. And then her younger sister here, Susan Wakeman Wilder, um, she's actually the great grandmother of Ruth Goodyear, who you see here on the right. And Ruth Goodyear is actually the reason that we know that Sarah Rosetta Wakeman was a soldier and had enlisted in the military. Um, she disguised herself as a soldier named Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S Wakeman, uh, when she was serving. And, um, it turned out that Sarah Rosetta or Lyons Wakeman actually sent a collection of letters home to her family all throughout the war. Um, we have that book, it's called An Uncommon Soldier, and you can see Ruth here holding uh, the uh, hardcover version of the book up, and I have the um, softcover version here uh, to show you all. And um, so this is actually a photo that I took of Ruth um, a couple of years ago when I went to visit her in North Carolina, and we went through her family archive. Um, and so her family found these letters in the 1970s when they were moving house and um, realized that their great-great, uh, their great-great-grand um, aunt was a Civil War soldier. However, during the war, uh, Sarah Rosetta Wakeman actually succumbed to disease after serving in several battles in the Red River Campaign in Louisiana. And um, she died of disease in a military hospital and was actually buried in the Chalmette National Cemetery near New Orleans under her male alias, which likely means that either the doctors that were caring for her and nurses in that hospital never realized that she was really a woman or what might have also happened was as they were cleaning her up after she died to be buried um they may have discovered she was really a woman and decided to keep her secret but either way um her gravestone in that cemetery i actually took this uh photograph while i was visiting that cemetery near new orleans and her grave has no marker acknowledging her real name or her real identity. 
And so the way that we learned about this is that in the 1990s, this family came forward um, prompted by an article that they read in the newspaper about a woman reenactor who actually had sued the National Park Service because she was kicked out of a reenactment for trying to portray a soldier. And together with uh, Ruth, that reenactor, Lauren Cook Wyke, actually published this book, the An Uncommon Soldier, The Civil War Letters of Sarah Rosetta Wakeman, um, in the early 90s. And um, they were able to go to that cemetery um, and see that grave. And actually, that is one of the reasons that I believe the grave is one of the cleanest in that cemetery is because once that information came out to the public and they were able to read these letters, um, that grave site is actually much more maintained than a lot of the other graves in that cemetery. There's uh, thousands of soldiers buried in that Shalmet Cemetery. And you can see that when I was there, um, someone had actually left a rose next to that gravestone, and most of the other graves in that cemetery were not as well cleaned and did not have any other kinds of markers next to them. So it sounds like people have heard this story and have wanted to go pay their respects to Rosetta. Another soldier that we know about because um, they are very well documented is Albert DJ Cashier. Now, Albert was actually born in Cloggerhead, Ireland, and um, Albert's birth name was Jenny Hodgers. And as a young teenager, Jenny Hodgers immigrated to the United States all alone with no family, um, no education, and was at that time completely illiterate. And so we believe that at the behest of Jenny's um, either father or stepfather, she decided to disguise herself as a man and she took on the name of Albert DJ Cashier. And at that point, Jenny lived basically the rest of her life as Albert and with everyone thinking that she was a man. Um, you can see here in this photograph that was taken during the war, um, Albert is on the right and his comrade, who was the tallest man in the unit, Albert being the shortest man in the unit, they took this photo together from what I understand um, almost as a joke because they wanted to show the smallest and the largest man in the unit. Um, However, later in Albert's life, after the war was over, having served in 40 battles, Albert moved to the small town of Soundman, Illinois, which is about two hours south of Chicago, where Albert started working as a lamplighter and uh, kind of general odd, odd, um, odd jobs man in the town. And in the early 1900s, um, Albert was hit by a car. Um, a very, very early car. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe like a Model A or a Model T. And um, Albert um, was physically injured. That ultimately led to Albert's uh, mental faculties to start deteriorating. And we think Albert developed what we would now call Alzheimer's or dementia. And Albert was admitted to a nursing home for old soldiers. When Albert was admitted to that nursing home, here's another image of Albert during the time of his military service. Um, but when Albert was admitted to that nursing home, um, he was discovered to not really be Albert underneath, but to have a female body. And the, um, the employees of that nursing home decided that Albert was not suffering from old age and dementia. What Albert was really suffering in their opinion um, was an illness of believing that he was a man. And so they tried to um, force Albert to live as a woman at that point in the uh, nursing home. Albert did not want to live as, uh, as a woman. Um, however, Albert really didn't have a choice at that point. So the hospital staff forced Albert to wear a dress and to live as Jenny. Um, Albert hadn't worn a dress in over 50 years by that point, um, very likely, and Albert tripped on that dress, which caused him to break his hip, and he actually spent the last two years of his life bedridden um, in 
basically the insane ward of that uh, nursing home. And um, at the point where Albert's uh, physicality was discovered by the staff of that nursing home, um, they started to publicize Albert's story. And so there were articles published all around the country. Um, I actually have a friend as far away as Australia who is able to find some articles about Albert's uh, gender in uh, Australian newspapers from the time period of the early 1900s. So this story was extremely sensational. It went all over the world because people were interested in learning this story about, you know, the American Joan of Arc or the American Mulan or whatever you want to um, call it. But Albert, um, Albert's story was publicized enough that the pension board actually got wind of Albert's gender and Albert's original identity as Jenny Hodgers and um, tried to revoke Albert's pension because there was no way that this soldier who was really a woman could have possibly served in 40 battles during the Civil War. However, at that point, Albert's comrades ended up writing to the pension board and getting Albert's pension reinstated. And Albert was buried ultimately with full military honors in that small town of Solomon. Another soldier that is somewhat well documented is Maria Lewis. And this is actually an image of me and uh, the primary researcher on Maria Lewis, um, who has written uh, an article for a book about the Battle of Waynesboro. Um, just this last summer, we actually went to um, a library in Pennsylvania and saw this real diary where this woman soldier, Maria Lewis, is documented. And the documentation that exists of Maria Lewis is only the diary of a Quaker abolitionist named Julia Wilbur, because Maria Lewis was not just posing as a man, she was a teenager who was born enslaved in Virginia, and she was serving disguised as a white man, even though she was a colored girl. And we know this because in this diary from Julia Wilbur in the entry dated April 4th, 1865, it says, a colored woman is here who has been with the 8th New York Cavalry for the last 18 months. She wore a uniform, rode a horse, and carried a sword and carbine just like a man. And that is what we knew about Maria Lewis until a few years ago, um, the Alexandria Historical Society, in the process of researching Julia Wilbur, went to this library and discovered that the pocket diary you see here in the image of me and uh, Dr. Anita Henderson, who is researching uh, Maria, was actually a pocket diary, and there is a long form diary in beautiful linen pages and perfect handwriting that has additional information about the story, which is that Maria Lewis was born a slave in Albemarle County, Virginia, and she escaped to the Union Army. And while she escaped, she started going by the alias of George Harris, and she was actually with the officers. Now, this is a unique feature of Maria's life and service because most of the women who served as soldiers were privates who did not tell anyone unless they had maybe a family member that they enlisted alongside that they were really women because they were afraid of getting discovered and ultimately drummed out of the army. However, Maria here is with the officers, and that is unique because there were people that were protecting her and her true identity, and um, that also very likely means that Maria had some information that was extremely useful to the army. Um, we know that Maria, through this diary, was at the Battle of Waynesboro, which was a small engagement near the end of the war um, in which uh, the 
Union army that uh, Maria was part of came into the town of Waynesboro and uh, took at least 500 prisoners. Um, there's some accounts that say up to 1,500 prisoners um, because General Early's you, uh, General Early's men who were in Waynesboro um, basically trying to hold on near the end of the war, um, they basically, the Union Army came through and they were at the end of their, uh, at the end of their rope, they were at the end of their supplies, and they basically all surrendered. There were also 17 flags that were captured in that, uh, in that battle. And uh, so those Confederate flags were then sent to the War Department with a delegation of soldiers, and Maria was with them. Uh, so this teenage girl who, who was um, born as a slave, uh, she was able to travel with the delegation who had captured those battle flags all the way to Washington, D.C., which is where she met Julia Wilbur. Um, we know that Julia Wilbur's brother was one of the officers in that unit, the 8th New York Cavalry, and so we think that Julia Wilbur's brother is likely the reason why, um, he, why this young girl was introduced to Julia Wilbur, um, who was working as an abolitionist in Alexandria, doing basically refugee resettlement for people who escaped from slavery. And so when Maria is introduced to Julia, Julia says that she's going to help Maria get a job uh, and a place to live in Alexandria because that's the work that she was doing. Um, I also was able through the process of making this film to visit Waynesboro um, where that battle took place. And this is a map that was drawn shortly after the war um, and the remarkable thing to me was that you could see um, the 8th New York, the unit that Maria was from, in this, uh, in this map, and um, you can see the 8th New York, and it says 4 p.m., they're on one side of the river, and at 3.30, well, what it really says is 3 and a half p.m., they were at the other side of the river on the other side of town. So we think that Maria and her unit, the 8th New York, rode through town capturing Confederates and then were able to make it all the way across the river in only half an hour. So it was a short battle, but it was somewhat consequential because they were able to capture these flags. And um, unfortunately, the leadership of the Confederate units uh, was able to escape and uh, they did not capture uh, officers for the most part. Another woman that we know about, so um, I neglected to mention that there were women soldiers both on the federal side, the ones I've been talking about so far have all been uh, Union soldiers, but there were also women on the Confederate side. And we think that it is possible that women might have even been more common on the Confederate side, because um, the Confederates near the end of the war were running so low on soldiers and really they just needed bodies. And in terms of this particular soldier, Jane Perkins, also an Irish immigrant who came to the United States um, as a teenager, um, Jane Perkins, when she was discovered, was actually discovered serving openly as a woman. And she had her hair in a long braid. And um, so there's a researcher, um, Shelby Harriel, who I think might actually be on this call right now, um, that has written a book about women soldiers in Civil War Mississippi. And um, she wrote an article a few years ago about Jane Perkins and wondering if it's possible that Jane Perkins is pictured in the image you see here on the right. Uh, Confederate prisoners at White House Landing in 1864. Um, she speculated by going through um, a blown up version of this image that it's possible that Jane Perkins is um, on the right side of the image. Um, however, um, I've learned more recently that it is also possible Jane Perkins wasn't in this image at all. Um, but we do believe that this image was taken uh, contemporaneously with Jane Perkins' capture. 
um, when she was serving as an artilleryman in, uh, in a Confederate unit. And so it is also possible that if Jane isn't in this picture, that some of her comrades might be. And um, one of the things that I've learned about from posing as a soldier in, um, in reenactment is that if someone is not expecting you to be a woman, they often don't know that they're a woman and you tell either you start speaking or you give it away on your own. And so we think it's possible that Jane could have still blended in quite easily um, because what we've learned is that women soldiers were a lot more similar to their male counterparts than they were different. Um, so a woman that has a questionable uh, documentation is Loretta Janetta Velasquez. Uh, Loretta Janetta Velasquez um, was, according to her autobiography, born in Cuba. Um, she was an aristocrat in Cuba and then moved to the New Orleans area uh, as a young woman, got married, and her husband uh, ended up going off to war, leaving her home alone by to herself to fend for herself on her own. Um, at that time, she claims to have basically raised her own unit and then gone off to war with that unit disguised as a man, um, hoping to eventually join back up with her husband. Um, however, she says in her book that her husband unfortunately was killed and so she was not able to rejoin him um, during, during that time. Um, her autobiography is the primary source for the information about her service. Um, there are no existing photographs of her as far as I know. Um, however, what was in her book um, published at the time was these woodcut drawings. And so you see the woodcut of her dressed as a female civilian, and then you see um, the woodcut of her dressed as um, her male alias, which was Lieutenant Harry T. Buford. Now, she says not only that she was uh, a soldier during the war, but she also claimed to have been an officer. At the time that her book was published, which was over a decade after the war was over, um, there were people in the... Um, military hierarchy that she said she served under. Um, again, General Jubal Early, who said that he did not believe her story and thought that she was a fake. So, um, and then just a few years ago in 2016, um, there was a book published to try to refute her autobiography in which a historian um, in Virginia, uh, William C. Davis, who goes by Jack, um, basically went through her autobiography trying to refute the facts that she presents. Um, from what I understand, historians now generally agree that there is a lot of truth in her book um, and think that she probably embellished quite a bit of it because she wanted to sell her book. It was one of her sources of income. Uh, however, um, there are also historians who completely disagree with that and agree with Jubal Early and say they think that she made it all up in order to sell her book. Um, from what I understand, William C. Davis was going around giving a lecture tour after this book was published, calling uh, Loretta Velasquez the Confederate Kardashian and basically saying that her, uh, her story uh, of living as Lieutenant Harry Buford was completely fabricated. So the record is not clear in many of these cases. Another person who the record is a bit unclear about is Francis Clayton. And that's actually the soldier that you see me portraying right now. Um, so from the story that has been told about her, which is predominantly told in newspaper accounts, uh, Francis Clayton was in her early 20s she joined a Missouri regiment along with her husband, 
We don't entirely know what his name is. Um, there's been historians that have tried to figure out what her husband might have been called by finding uh, census records of other Francis Claytons, but it has not been shown that uh, that name actually really 100% matches with um, what her husband's name might have been. Um, but her assumed identity was Jack Williams. And when she enlisted with this Missouri regiment, um, the story that was reported was that she enlisted in the Missouri regiment because she was originally from Minnesota. And if she had tried to enlist with the Minnesota regiment, someone might have recognized her and might have revealed her to really be a woman. Now, um, the reason I chose to portray her is because from what the newspaper accounts say, Frances was very tall, she was very lanky, like myself, she was from Minnesota, and um, she has a somewhat similar look to the look that I have, and so when I took on this persona, the reason I chose to portray her was because I felt that I could um, do this impression as accurately as possible, unlike someone like Albert Cashier, who was around five foot two, which is a lot shorter than I am in real life. Um, so the reason we know what Francis looks like uh, so well is actually because uh, Francis Clayton's photographs were taken by one of the most famous working photographers during the time period, um, whose name was Samuel Mossery of Boston, Massachusetts. And he took six images at least of Francis, three in a uniform and three in a dress. And you can see here that Francis is pictured in um, a cavalry uniform. And we know that because the crossed swords on Francis's hat um, denote cavalry and the cords that would have been around that hat we know would have been yellow that's the cavalry color um however on the back of many of these photographs which were printed and reprinted and printed and reprinted and sent all over uh the united states following the war um there are some photographs that say she was in an artillery unit and some that say that she was in the cavalry unit and from what I've learned by trying to recreate these images and studying the sword that she's carrying, I have been told that the sword is not even an artillery or a cavalry sword. We think it might have been an infantry officer's sword. So the question about which branch of the military Francis served in uh, is potentially debatable. And there have been historians uh, subsequent to these photos, uh, much more recently, that have done research on the units that were drawn in on the back of some of these photographs and have learned that the units that she was reported to have served in probably didn't exist, or if they did exist, did not exist at the time of the battles that she says that she served in. Um, and we know from reading a variety of newspaper accounts that were printed and reprinted and sent all over the United States that um, some newspaper accounts uh, say different things about, for example, how many times that she was wounded, how long she served, uh, where she was, uh, and which battle she was in. And so by following the newspaper accounts, we know that Francis's story is extremely incomplete. And because of some of these newspaper accounts and not being able to find any enlistment records for Francis um, or for Francis's alias in the units that she is reported to have served in, um, some historians also believe that these images um, were of a case of stolen valor and that Francis did not really serve in the war. Now, what I believe is that Francis is pictured many, many times. And so if her service record is not true, 
she at least is very representative of the idea of a woman soldier. And these publicity photos made it clear that during that time period, people were extremely aware that women soldiers did serve. And so I like to think if Francis wasn't really a soldier, maybe Francis was the first reenactor, <laughs> or in this case, the first reenactress. And in that article that Philip mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, I go into depth about uh, more reasons why we think these photos are a very good representation of a woman soldier, and also why we speculate and wonder why do people keep thinking that this is a brand new thing every time women serve in the military because they knew about it the whole time. And also there are still copies of these photographs that are going around being sold. Um, here is an example of an auction site that was selling these side-by-side -side images of Francis in, it, Francis in her uniform and Francis in her dress. Um, the estimate for what this was sold for was up to $13,000 in 2019. Um, and I've also seen some more recent uh, copies of this image uh, being sold online. Um, I hope at some point to be able to afford one myself if any do become available. Um, so again, there's a lot we know about women soldiers from the time period from these very well-documented cases like the one of um, Sarah Rosetta Wakeman and the one of Albert Cashier or Jenny Hodgers. Um, but the women whose soldiers who served most successfully are likely still unknown to us because the majority of these women were not trying to reveal their true identities unless after the war they were trying to seek a pension. And in the case of someone like uh, Rosetta, she could have been buried in that cemetery for, you know, another century and a half. And we would never have known because she did not come forward with her story. She was killed during the war. Um, so a lot of the cases that we know about from researches, researchers happened because the woman was injured and that made it so that she was discovered in a hospital. Maybe she was captured like someone um, like Jane Perkins or possibly that she died. If she died and her dead body was discovered, it's also very possible we will never know her true identity because she would have been serving under an assumed name. It's also extremely difficult to find records about women from this time period, any genealogist will tell you, because Women are often born with one name, then get married, change their name, and suddenly their records are completely different because they have a completely different surname. And unless you knew who they were first and then second, you will not be able to find those census records. So it's possible that Frances Clayton was not born Frances Clayton, that she took on that name when she got married to her husband, or it's also possible that her name was misspelled, <laughs> um, which is why a lot of the accounts say Francis Clayton instead of Francis Clayton, or they say C-L-A-T-O-N instead of C-L-A-Y-T-O-N. Um, so it can be extremely difficult to uh, follow up with documentation about these women soldiers. Um, however, there are a few accounts um, from journal entries from people who were serving alongside these women that some of them were discovered because they actually gave birth while in service. Um, some came forward uh, during the war or were discovered following the, the war. A few applied for pensions and then some like Sarah Rosetta Wakeman, their secret was revealed many, many years later. Misconceptions about women soldiers. Um, one misconception is that women soldiers were prostitutes. This is also a misconception about women who are trying to reenact, um, is that you're joining up with the military or you're joining up with the reenacted military so that you can find a man or in this case, sell your services. However, if a woman was truly disguised as a man, no one in the unit would know, in which case this could be easily debunked. 
Also, there's an idea that all of the women who did this might have been transgender individuals. Now, we think maybe somebody like Albert Cashier, who after the war continued living as a man up until old age, it's possible if they lived in the modern time that they might have identified as transgender. However, the vast majority of these women who survived the war went back to living as women, and um, so we think that that idea could also be debunked. There's also an idea that they didn't serve as well as their male counterparts. Um, now, the historians who have written the primary research book about this, um, about the story of women soldiers, uh, Lauren Cook White and um, Deanne Blanton, who wrote this book, They Fought Like Demons, um, they also did an analysis of the success of women soldiers in terms of you know, if they got court-martialed, if they were dismissed, um, how they did in different battles, and they have come to conclude that the women actually served just as competently as their male counterparts during the war. Um, the idea that when they were discovered, they were always dismissed also is not true, as in the case of Jane Perkins, who was discovered when she was captured, and we think that it's very likely that Jane Perkins was allowed to continue serving even though she was a woman because it was late in the war and by the time she was discovered, she was already well battle tested and they would much rather have somebody that knew what they were doing and keep them than somebody that didn't know what they were doing um, that is a brand new recruit um, that you haven't served alongside and don't know is going to have your back. Um, there's also an idea that they only served for very short periods of time. Um, in many cases, it's probably because the women we know about were discovered, and once they were discovered, they were dismissed. Uh, however, we know from the account of Rosetta Wakeman, the account of um, Albert Cashier, that they would have served up until death or their entire enlistment and then gone on to be a member of a veterans organization. So the idea that they only served for short periods of time also very unlikely. Um, there's also other historians that say that they think that they were crazy. Um, that's obviously what they thought of Albert Cashier when that nursing home discovered that he was actually Jenny Hodgers underneath. Um, however, um, during the entire war, no one claimed that Albert was crazy. During his subsequent life um, as a lamplighter and general odd odd jobsman in his small town, no one claimed that he was crazy. And so it wasn't until this idea that, oh my goodness, this is really a woman. How could a woman possibly serve in the military um, that these ideas were um, started to come about? Um, there's also an idea, and this is something that I would like to think um, that women might have served in the Civil War to make a feminist statement. But what we know about most of these women is that they were extremely poor, they didn't pen diaries, they didn't publicize what they were doing heavily, and so the idea that they were doing this for the purposes of saying that women should have equal rights, they were doing this for the purposes of survival. Women could make more as a soldier than women could as a domestic servant uh, in really any context. And we know that because in her letters home to her family, Rosetta Wakeman repeatedly talks about how much money she's making, how she's never seen so much money in her life, and how she's going to do all of these great things with her money if she survives and when she gets home. Um, the last misconception, again, is that they were highly different from their male counterparts. And from what we've learned about most of these women is that they could not have disguised themselves as men if they were extremely different from their male counterparts. They passed for men, they blended in, they kept their heads down, and they did the work. And most of them, we probably will never learn about because the documentation just isn't there. However, 
There are some military roles that women performed as women throughout the war. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that there were other women like Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, who served as a surgeon during the Civil War. Um, she is still the only woman in American history to ever have been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, which she earned for um, going behind enemy lines and um, even and also serving basically as a spy. She would go into civilian towns around near where her unit was stationed and she would care for the civilians in that town and then use that to collect information about where the Confederate army might be. Um, Dr. Mary, after the war, was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, however, uh, several years later, the federal government changed the rules about who can be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, and they tried to revoke Dr. Mary's medal. Now, she basically gave them the response over my dead body. And from what I understand, she was buried wearing that medal. And so they never pried it from her cold, dead hands. Um, the photo you see here of her on the left is, um, is in the time uh, shortly following the war. And then the photo you see of her on the right is of her in her older age when she became extremely outspoken and did try to use her military service to make a feminist statement. Uh, Dr. Mary was an active suffragist. She was also an active uh, women's dress reformer. And in her later life, she started wearing almost exclusively clothing that is designated as men's clothing. Um, and she was eventually arrested for impersonating a man. Uh, she ended up going to court and saying, I served my country and I am a woman wearing my own clothes and I should be allowed to basically to wear what I want. This is not a direct quote, but this is my interpretation of what, of what she said um, in that court case. And she was eventually released and allowed to go about her business and continue wearing uh, suits and top hats and other things that I really personally enjoy. Um, Marie Tepe, who you see here on the left, she is what we would have called a vivandier. Um, a vivandier also could be called a canteen girl or a cantinaire. And they were um, originally women's auxiliary positions that were in the French uh, army that was serving in North Africa. And so you'll see um, vivandiers in uh, what we call zouave units. And so they're units that you might see in photographs. This would be great for the costuming folks out there, but they're the ones who wear the short uh, vests and the harem pants and the fezes or the um, turbans. Uh, and you'll see them with, you know, red trousers and really bright uh, blue colors and uh, Marie fashioned her own uniform and uh, was able to serve in actually more than one unit. Um, she enlisted, she was a French immigrant, she enlisted alongside her husband and then her husband did something that she did not appreciate which was the money that she was making by serving as an auxiliary um, personnel in that unit uh, he actually gambled it away in a drunken binge one night, and so she ended up leaving her husband and joining a different unit. Um, Marie was known to have carried a pistol with her, and um, there's actually a reenactor in Pennsylvania who does a first-person impression of Marie. And uh, Marie's unit was awarded the Kearney Cross, and you see her wearing that medal here along with her, uh, her uniform that she made in the style of the Zouaves, only with uh, a skirt over her pants, which is called a uh, reform dress in, during that time period. Uh, most women's dresses went all the way down to the floor. Um, but some of the women like Marie and like our friend Dr. Mary um, wore a reform dress, which was trousers underneath and a short skirt on the top. 
And then another woman that I think is extremely important to acknowledge, who we might call a Black Vivandier, is Susie King Taylor. And Susie King Taylor wrote this memoir, Reminiscences of My Life in Camp, um, following the war. And she is one of the women documented to have served in a United States Colored Troops unit. Um, while she wasn't necessarily an official enlisted soldier, um, she does report learning to load weapons and serving as a nurse. And prior to the Civil War, battlefield nurses were exclusively men and really all military nurses were exclusively men. And so as a female nurse who was there um, in times of battle with the United States Colored Troops, I do think that she deserves a position as being acknowledged as a military, um, military member. Uh, the other uh, women who were serving openly as women were a small unit uh, in LaGrange, Georgia, the Nancy Hartz Militia, and they were actually a unit uh, that was raised in public um, by Nancy Hill Morgan in uh, South Georgia with the purpose of learning to use military equipment so they could defend their town when the Union came through. Um, I was part of a recreation of uh, the Nancy Hartz militia. That's me in the front there um, for a nonfiction novel called The Cotillion Brigade, which I understand has some historical, heavy, heavy historical embellishments um, and uh, has taken some, um, some liberties with uh, the historic record. Um, but that photograph was taken actually right here in Salt Lake City, where I am based, um, with in front of a house that uh, was co contemporary to that time period. Um, and so we tried to give an impression of what a woman soldier um, who was in a ladies militia might really look like. Um, but this is also um, not 100% accurate in terms of what that uniform um, might have really looked like. Um, you can see a few of the women in this image are seen in their hoops. If a woman was doing military drill, she would absolutely not have been wearing a hoop because they are very cumbersome and difficult. So um, I am wearing a day dress in this uh, in this image. And what I think probably would have happened is that they would have had a shortened day dress um, in that reform style. So um, I'm pretty much running out of time at this point. Uh, and I have um, some research recommendations, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen um, to give folks an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, but I do have some research recommendations. Like I said, I've got uh, Susie King Taylor's Reminiscences of My Life in Camp, An Uncommon Soldier, The Civil War Letters of Sarah Rosetta Wakeman. They Fall Like Demons. Uh, and then also a newer book, uh, Behind the Rifle, uh, which is uh, by Shelby Harriel uh, about women soldiers in Civil War Mississippi. And then the last book that I really want to um, tell people about is Pantaloons and Power, which is about uh, reform dress during that time period, uh, like I talked about. And here's a long for a longer image of uh, Dr. Mary Walker with her reform dress, which is cut off uh, just above the knee. I was wondering, I'll start out with the first question. Could you talk a little bit about what inspired you to actually make this documentary and what the process was and what it was sort of like personally, what your journey is for that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what inspired me to make this documentary uh, was that when I went to Gettysburg in uh, 2012 for that 149th anniversary, uh, I was invited by the captain of one unit to join that unit. It's the 6th New York Independent Battery out of uh, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And then I went back to Atlanta, Georgia, where I was living at the time, and went to a reenactment 
tried to find a unit that would allow me to join down south and was told by the first unit commander that I met, we do not have women soldiers in our unit. It is completely frowned upon within this hobby. Um, you would be much better off portraying a civilian woman and I can't possibly understand why you would want to portray a soldier. Um, so in, uh, <laughs> In kind of a defiant style, I chose to not listen to that man, and I called back the first unit, the 6th New York Independent Battery, and uh, I joined up with them. And my first ever reenactment was the 150th anniversary Battle of Antietam in Sharpsburg, Maryland, which had um, I maybe over 10,000 participants. <laughs> and um, I had the opportunity to fire a cannon for the first time. And at that point, I thought to myself, why would you not want to be a soldier? This is so much fun. And uh, since then, the only excuse I've had for putting on a dress was my recreation of the Francis Clayton side-by-side uh, -side image and then my recreation of the Nancy Hart's militia. <laughs> It looks like there is a question uh, in the chat. Um, yes, we absolutely, I can put together that list. Um, we also have um, on our website, reenactress.com, um, there is a list of books and different units and um, also other web information um, on our website, reenactress.com. Um, have you read Sharon McCrum Mysteries, a couple women serving in the Civil War that are supposed to be fictional versions? I have not. So that is a really great, um, I have not read that, um, that series. Um, although I do know that there are many fictionalized stories of Civil War women soldiers, um, one was in the recent uh, PBS series, uh, Mercy Street, which was about um, the hospital system during the Civil War. And there have been other um, fictionalizations of the stories of women soldiers. Um, another is uh, a, a film, a, a film called Union, uh, which is a fictionalization. Um, Ghost Riders, McPherson's Lament um, are the two titles that, um, thank you, Anne, for putting that into the chat. Um, yeah, other questions folks have? I have one other question. Oh, are please. Are you still raising funds for, to finish the production of the uh, documentary? Uh, yes, so we are still, um, our project has a nonprofit fiscal sponsor, so any donations made to the film are always tax deductible. Um, you can go on our website, reenactress.com, and find out more about how you can contribute to the success of the film. We're currently in the post-production phase, so most of our project has been recorded at this point and we are um working on the editing um we're hoping to get an original score um we have recently um we did a fundraiser over the summer and used uh some of that funding to pay for uh licensing material from some news stations uh which is much more costly <laughs> than you might uh, than you might imagine um but uh, yeah, so that is in progress right now and we're hoping to have the film completed next year. Um, I see a couple of folks who contributed to the project on this call. So I wanna thank you again. Um, it looks like another, I saw another question in the chat. Um, do you make your costumes or have others make them? Uh, so that is a great question. Um, the uh, uniform that I'm wearing right now, um, this uh, waistcoat and this um, this hat, um, those I had to have specially made. Um, there's also a jacket that goes along with this, but it's a little warm in my in my house. But this one I did have specially made. 
Um, these were made by what we call sutlers. Um, so they're basically vendors that sell historic reproduction um, materials. Um, if you look up Sutler, S-U-T-L-E-R, um, you can find all sorts of um, historic uniforms. Um, the dress that I wore for the Francis Clayton impression, um, that was actually so custom by one of my friends who is a historical costumer. Um, her name is Michelle and she lives in Southern Georgia. And she used um, patterns that she found on a variety of historical websites. And I believe in the article that I wrote, I think I um, I mentioned some of those um, vendors that uh, have patterns and a few of the websites where the patterns came from. Um, but yeah, that dress was made in um, the style and from a pattern that is from that time period. At reenactments, do you wear the full outfits they wore or do you cheat with some lighter weight materials? Um, I think a lot of the women who portray soldiers in reenactments tend to actually wear more than their male counterparts because in order to hide the curves, um, keeping your waistcoat on all the time is highly advisable. Um, and there are a lot of reenactments I've been to where the men will take their uh, waistcoats off and just be in their shirt sleeves um, during, uh, during some of the hotter days. And so, um, but we do wear uh, materials that are um, authentic reproductions to the time period. So my shirt is made of cotton. Um, the buttons are all hand sewn on. Um, the vests are made of wool and they have common, uh, or they, sorry, they have cotton uh, lining underneath. Um, I'm also wearing uh, cotton uh, drawers, which are really helpful because when you get hot in the wool, it starts to itch pretty considerably. Um, but yes, we do our, our very best to try to have things that are, if not actual items from the time period, are as accurate reproductions as we, as we can uh, make. Um, I've actually undone some of the stitching in some of my uh, reproductions because I could tell that maybe the buttonholes were sewn by machine and they didn't have machines that could uh, produce button holes during that time. So I've gone back and hand stitched around the buttonholes. Um, and then I also do have a, um, a pocket watch that is a genuine article that my partner uh, got for me a few years ago. And this one is uh, from, we think the 18, 1880s or 1890s. So like almost exactly right. Um, but is the style from, from that time period. Um, some of the common Sutler companies. Um, so there are uh, companies, uh, so sorry, that's a question from N. Shapiro in the chat. Um, some of the Sutler companies, um, there are a few that do things online. Um, there's one in Gettysburg called um, the Regimental Quartermaster that they have a lot of different reproduction items. Um, SNS Sutlery. Um, there's one in South Georgia that I've gotten a lot of things from. We also have links on our website to um, several of those vendors. But again, if you search Sutler, and I'll put the word in the chat, um, or sorry, you have it here in the chat. Um, if you search Civil War Sutler, or you can even search like Revolutionary War Sutler, and you will be able to find a lot of really um, brilliant people that are doing their absolute best to make the uniforms and other pieces uh, as accurate as possible. There's also a lot of really great Facebook groups. Um, one for, uh, there's one called the Civilian Civil War Closet and they will only talk to you about civilian attire. Um, and then there's uh, several other Facebook groups um, however, I will make the caveat that some of these Facebook groups 
um, do have some pretty anti-women soldier <laughs> um, folks that are part of them. And that will uh, that will tell you that there were no women soldiers in the Civil War, and if there were, they're not worth portraying. And um, so I I personally would also caution you uh, about different Civil War reenactment groups because they are not always the most women friendly. Uh, from Anne Davenport, has anyone reenacted the Battle of Atlanta, the Cyclorama, the 360 degree painting of it depicts it in great detail, and that would benefit reenactors. Um, I've been to the Cyclorama. Um, when I started reenacting, I was living in Atlanta, um, and uh, that Cyclorama is extremely fun. I have not been to it since they relocated it, so I'm not sure if the rotating platform is still the same. Um, but that cyclorama, so it's a 360 degree painting that fills an entire room. Um, that painting has been relocated since I was there um, probably about six, seven years ago. Um, they restored it and they moved it to a new location. Um, there's also a great Civil War cyclorama in Gettysburg at the Visitor Center um, that I highly recommend. Um, but yes, there are a lot of reenactors who have gone and studied those paintings in great detail. Um, and we continuously try to study photographs to make sure that things are accurate. Um, but I will say the photographs aren't always 100% accurate because people during that time period like to take stuff for their version of Instagram in the same way that we do. And so you will see them a lot of times with a lot more weapons than they would have had out on the field. Um, you will see people wearing uniforms that were in ranks above their station. Um, when people went to get a photograph taken in a studio, studios often had props. They had costume pieces uh, that were not what the soldiers would be wearing on the field. And people wanted to look good when they were sending photos home to their family. So when you see <laughs> a photograph from, uh, from that time period, you may be seeing that, for example, someone might be wearing a hat that's different than the hat they would have had. They might have a sword that is a prop piece from that photo studio. Um, they might have different embellishments that were not necessarily accurate to what they would have had with them on the field during the battle. Um, but the pieces that you see would have existed at least during that time period. Any other questions? What's been the reaction of the reenactment community to this project you're doing? And have you gotten any reaction from some of your preview videos? Yes, um, the reaction has been a bit mixed. Um, like I mentioned, there are quite a few Facebook groups for Civil War reenactors um, where uh, there are people who do not appreciate the idea of women soldiers or the idea of um, women participating in reenactment. Um, in the past few years, there's been um, some political hubbub surrounding cross-dressing, which is what we do when we're portraying soldiers. Um, I am currently dressed as a man from the time period, um, or you could say as a woman posing as a man, kind of a Victor Victoria style. Um, but there's been a lot of political um, issues surrounding performing in drag um, over the past few years. And um, some of the reactions to what I'm doing are similar to what maybe drag queens might experience. Um, I do a lot of presentations for school children in, and I am cross-dressing. And uh, there are states where they have tried to prohibit uh, performing in attire that is impersonating a gender that is not the gender that you have um, in your body. 
Um, and it is very possible that what I'm doing would also be restricted by some of those laws. Um, so, and, you know, I mean, it's, it, yeah, well, I do what I do for the purposes of all ages. I want young people and older people and middle-aged people, and I want them to know that these stories are true and that these stories are real and that people have always done what they needed to do to get access to rights. Um, and that it has, it still is not equal for women in the world. Um, and the idea that I mean, Dr. Mary Walker was arrested for impersonating a man. She said, I'm wearing trousers because I want to wear trousers. But she had to go to court over that. And I, I personally, you know, I would be, you know, if, if I went to court over what I'm doing because of some of these anti-women impersonating men <laughs> uh, laws, you know, I mean, I, I would be willing to do that. Um, Lauren cook uh the reenactor who was uh, the, um, who compiled and edited Sarah Rosetta Wakeman's letters into a book, and she's the reason we know about Rosetta. She was kicked out of a reenactment at the Antietam National Battlefield Park, which she doesn't like people to know because she loves that park. She's never stopped loving that park. Um, but she was um, banned from a reenactment because she was a woman trying to portray a soldier. And she sued the National Park Service for a dollar in damages. And she did win that lawsuit, um, but she never saw the dollar. So um, this has always been a contentious issue. Um, we know that, I mean, if you look it up, women were not allowed to legally serve in combat roles in the United States military until 2013, which was during the process that I've been working on this uh, film. And it wasn't opened up to all branches of the military until 2016 was when that was fully implemented. And so, I mean, we know that women in the military now still experience much higher cases of assault. Um, we know that women in the military now have issues with harassment and discrimination, but they've been there the whole time. And I don't know why it's continuously a problem. Um, Women still, though, are not subject to the draft in the United States, which means they might have the same right to serve in the military, but they're not necessarily subjected to the same responsibility uh, as their male counterparts. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a it's a continuous issue, and the response has been in line with kind of the general response to women trying to do things we're not supposed to do <laughs> um, in many different contexts. Um, someone else has a question. Um, when you said the more successful female soldiers would never be known because they were never discovered, someone said once that the most successful art forgeries are still hanging in museums because they have never been discovered to not be what they portray. Yeah, I, I think that's there. that's absolutely the case is that if the women did this well and they did it right, they would probably have been, you know, they would have died and been buried as men. And just like Rosetta Wakeman's grave doesn't actually have her real name on it. You know, that, that's what's on the wall in the museum that is that cemetery is her assumed identity. And yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. And uh, one of the arguments that we keep hearing over and over about why women shouldn't portray soldiers in the Civil War is that there's so f there were so few of them. And from what I understand, Lauren and Deanne documented about 250 individual cases. There was uh, Mary Livermore, the uh, Civil War nurse, in a in a book is quoted as saying that she thought there were between 400 and a thousand women but also she said and probably more because 
they wanted to be there and so they did what they needed to get to be there um and then women did so many other jobs during the civil war that women were not allowed to do prior to that and that keeps happening anytime a country goes to war suddenly restrictions get lifted and women are seen as full members of society and then the war is over and somehow everybody forgets what they did <laughs> um Oh yeah, when did the US Army start allowing women to serve in the military? Um, the official answer is the combat exclusion policy ended in 2013. So that is, we're at the 10 year anniversary of when women were allowed to serve in the military in combat roles. Um, however, women have been serving in some way in the military again the whole time and the civil war was really a time where nurses who were part of a volunteer civilian corps people started thinking of nurses as women um before that medical professionals were all pretty much men um however we learned during the civil war that when women come in and serve less people die <laughs> because women care about people getting fed and they care about things being clean and they care about morale. And so um, so women have always really contributed to the US Army and it was really in the Civil War that women started having some of those major roles and you're, you know, you're Mary Bickerdyke and, uh, and, Mary Livermore and, um, you know, Clara Barton. And I mean, they're, they're people that showed what women can do. And then after that, continued using what they did during that time period to try to make it so women could have full rights as citizens. Because before this, women were not citizens and it you know we know that women white women got the vote in 1920 and then it was still after that that native american women um that black women that you know and people with disabilities you know that couldn't read <laughs> well enough or you know couldn't you know needed braille translations or people that are not first language English speakers, like the rights are always expanding and contracting. And I think it's really important to have these examples of when people went outside what was expected of them to say, look, that means they can and we should let them if that's what they wanna do. Um, what are your plans for exhibiting the documentary? What's it's complete? What kind of places are you thinking about? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I'm hoping that the documentary is going to speak much more clearly and with much better visuals and things than this talk. And I appreciate you all listening to me for such a long time. Um, once the film is finished, we're hoping that it's going to start with a festival e exhibition. And so we'll tr we're going to try and send it to festivals all around the country. Um, there are specific festivals for um, films about women. Uh, there are specific contests for things about the military. Um, there are festivals for films about um, gender impropriety, you might say, and like LGBTQ festivals. Um, that we think might be really interested in this project because of the cross-dressing element. Um, and there's a lot of museums that have expressed interest in, um, in exhibiting the film. So National Museum of Civil War Medicine, um, I've interviewed a, a person who works there. Um, we did a talk at the New York Historical Society. Um, we have a military museum here in Salt Lake. 
Um, there's been some fantastic folks up in NorCal that have been supporting the film, including the Silicon Web Costumers Guild. And I'm hoping that, you know, once we have the film ready to exhibit online, um, that we can send it out to your membership. And then maybe we can do another Q&A about more about the process of making the film and um, so yeah, I, I'm hoping that it'll go out to a really wide audience and that people will be excited about it. I've been contacted by, um, by elementary, high schools, and universities. <laughs> um, and then I've had people from England and people from Australia, and um, I got a email from somebody in Spain uh, not that long ago. Um, that's interested in the, in the project. So um, we've had a, an amazing level of support from our community members, and we just really appreciate the fact that people think this is an important story to tell, and I'm really hoping that the film will tell it even better than I can in, <laughs> um, in a talk like this. This is really the ultimate crossplay, which is a term that customers use for uh, th that exact same thing, but cosplay in general, which is having somebody become the character and embody mm -hmm. the character as they wear the costume for the character as well. So, and I, um, I do, I think that, like I said, like whether Frances Clayton's service record is a hundred percent accurate in the newspapers that were written about her, like she's a person who, you know we have these photographs of her she really existed i would love if anybody out there knows anything more about her and what happened to her we don't know she kind of disappeared into obscurity and it's been a real honor to me to get to embody her and to try to put myself in her shoes and think about what she would have been going through and I mean, if she was the first to an actor and not a real soldier, like she knew that these women were doing this and she knew that that was a way that she could go out and, you know, have a career and get to make money. And I I feel like, you know, you you have these, sometimes people call it a civil war moment um, or a, you know, cross generational moment, and I, you have these times where you think, "Gosh, this must have been so hard," or "Gosh, this must have been so, so weird," or and sometimes it's, "Gosh, this must have been so fun." And I, I mean, I read Rosetta Wakeman's letters, and like, there's so many times where she talks about how she's having a great time. And I, I think it's important to pay homage to these people, but like, they were just like us in here, <laughs> you know, in, in their hearts, they had hopes and dreams and loves and, and they had a good, you know, they had a good time and they laughed and they, they, you know, and I, and I feel like one of the things that people say about women portraying soldiers is that you're doing them a disservice by by not taking their service as seriously as it deserves and then I go and I read Rosetta talking about how uh, you know she says I she says we were on a battalion drill and we were charging about and going double quick and one of the company seamen fell down and got a bayonet run through his leg and you better believe he bled like a stuck hog like she says these really hilarious things and like Part of me is like, I don't think they would have, I'm, I'm sure they thought about this situation seriously and they were afraid and they were brave and they did really hard things. And then I'm sure they laughed like crazy, just like we do now. And that's really part of what makes it so wonderful is just thinking about, it gives you a chance to remember these people that might have been forgotten. And I really appreciate that. We look forward to having you back when uh, when the video comes out to talk about the reaction to it and, and hear about its success. So thanks a lot. 
Thank you so much, Philip, and thanks to the whole group. And um, I'm I really hope that this is useful for you at home and also the folks who are going to watch the recording after the fact. Um, thanks again for inviting me, and I. I can I can never talk about this too much, so I hope I said something interesting. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for giving this talk. It's been really, really interesting, and I've enjoyed enjoyed listening to it. So I want to talk a little bit about our next webinar. It's going to be on January 14th, 2024, and the topic of the video is in conversation with Susan Clausen, becoming Edith Head. Edith Head, as most of you know, uh, was a legendary costume designer, and she won a record of eight Academy Awards for Best Costume Design between 1949 and 1973. With her one-woman show, A Conversation with Edith Head, actress Susan Clausen created a highly acclaimed theatrical performance based upon the legendary Hollywood costume designer that's toured around the world. In this webinar, Susan will be talking about the show, how she discovered her strong resemblance to Edith Head and realized that there was a compelling story to be told. She'll also discuss her extensive research to gain deeper insight into the woman behind the legend, as well as her career as an actress and as a managing artistic director of the Invisible Theater in Tucson, Arizona. So please join us for that. Thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you next time.